morning, I'm Jim Dooler, preaching guy at the Astoria Christian Church. This Sunday morning, May the 24th, we are at the Bridge to Nowhere, as some of my friends call it. It goes over four miles to the state of Washington. Today, I want to talk about the followers of Jesus being a bridge to God. It's hard for a lot of us pastor types to, uh, to hang around non-Christian types, those whose lives aren't built on uh, the spiritual values that that we value that we cherish and I understand that a lot of churches they have a lot of demands a lot of expectations and, and pastors are just really busy and, and a lot of them don't have time to build their relationships with people far from God what I find is is when I hang around people that aren't necessarily Christians and they find out I'm pastorized and reverenated as as I like to say they start acting weird like they start saying, oh, I'm sorry, pastor, I didn't mean to swear, or they stop telling their, their off-color jokes and, and things like that. Um, and I don't like people talking that way necessarily, but I, I don't want them to stop just because I'm in the room. I, I just something about that, you know, if they want to stop it because they have a reverence for God, that's actually where I'd like for them to go. But I don't want to be their morals police. I think I do a pretty good job at it because uh, years ago I was playing racquetball and I'll talk a little bit more about my racquetball career in, uh, in a few minutes. But the director of the racquetball at the YMCA in Maryland, uh, she found out that I was a, that I was a pasteurized, reverenated type. And she goes, is it true? And I sheepishly kind of said, yeah. And she burst out laughing. She, she couldn't believe it because apparently people have this stereotype of what a what a minister is supposed to look like, and, and I blew that, and, and uh, I wasn't unhappy about that. I was blessed at the church in Maryland to uh, not only be allowed to hang out with uh, non-Christians, but, but encouraged. So I, I played racquetball a lot. I mean, four or five times a week. I, I love the racquetball court. I love the physical activity, but more than that, I love the camaraderie. I loved being around guys that, that were real, and uh, I made some great friends. Uh, I mean, we went rafting together. Some of them went up to Canada on a, on a vacation with me. We, we ate out. Some of you guys are watching this right now. <laughs> you remember those days, and you're going to send me funny messages about that. Um, I did ministry stuff with them. I, I did a wedding. I, I, one, of, one of the most dramatic funerals I've ever been a part of came as a result of a connection with my, my buddies playing, playing racquetball. I, I did some counseling with some of those guys. It's said of Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 11 that he was a glutton and a drunkard. And then the worst insult they could throw at him, and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, we know Jesus wasn't a drunkard. We know he wasn't a glutton. He was sinless. But he never denied the friend of tax collectors and sinners part of that accusation. And it had to be, you don't earn that reputation just by a one-shot deal. It's not like he had one party and they, oh, there's Jesus. This was apparently his pattern of life. He was hanging out with people far from God and enjoying those times with those sinners. And they enjoyed him. And let's be honest, most sinners, quotation marks, aren't thrilled when the pastor shows up. Oh, there goes the fun. They, they didn't say that about Jesus. So there was, there was something about him that allowed him to be in the presence of people far from God and connect with God, something we need to recover if we're gonna make an impact in our community. So let me ask you a question. How many non-believing friends would you say that you have? And I don't mean acquaintances. I don't mean people that you kind of nod to, oh yeah, that's, that's so-and-so, but they're your friends. You enjoy spending time with them. They've got your cell phone, your, your cell phone number. They've got your email. You, you do stuff together. That is an important question to ask because let, let me, I have a high-tech gizmo here. Okay. Uh, this is, I, I learned this years ago. Um, but for most followers of Jesus, not everyone, but we come to Christ and, and we have a whole bunch of friends that aren't Christians. But the longer we're in church, we start doing Bible study and then we start getting active and then we start serving more and we're going on mission trips and teaching Bible school and stuff like that. It's easy to get to the point after seven or eight years, we have very few close non-Christian friendships. 
which is great in one hand because we love the fellowship of the church. Christians, you know, done well. We are a great bunch to hang around with. We love each other's company. But the problem with that is who are we impacting? Who do we know that we can, we can talk to about Jesus? Jesus said we're supposed to be salt, and, and the salt's got to get out of the shaker. The, the salt can only impact the meat or the food if it touches it. But so many of our churches are just like weekly salt shaker meetings, and we sit around, we talk about how great salt is. The ministry of God doesn't take place in the salt shaker meeting. It takes place out there. That's why we're looking at Tim Harlow's book, Life on Mission, Finding God's Heart for the World. How do we take our faith out of the church building and take it out where the people that really need it, where they are? Tim Harlow says that for too long, the church has been acting like our, like our mission is to invite people to church or to the building or to a service. And, and that's got to change. It's understandable. Um, when people come to church, they're on, they're on our turf. They're on our terms. We're on familiar ground. We know the rules. We know how to act. But Jesus said, no. You go. Luke 19.10. Jesus has been criticized by the religious mucky yucks. Again, for eating at the home of a tax collector who's worse than a sinner. Zacchaeus, you remember that story? And Jesus, in defense of why he was spending time with tax collectors and sinners, he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He could have just sat up in heaven and said, Hey, if they want me, they know where to find me. But no, he went on a rescue mission. And now he says to his followers, that's you and me, if you're a follower of Jesus, you share that mission with me. You don't just invite them to come in, although that's part of it, and that has been effective to some extent. So how do you go from inviting people to going where they are? And the key is the R word. Now, I'm going to unveil in the church here in a few weeks some more R words, but, but this is a critical one, and the word is relationships. It's relationships. Right, let me let me see if I can unpack this a little bit for you. Um, what what is your reaction when the doorbell rings and you look through the little people and there's two ladies standing there in dresses and they have magazines and books? It's the JWs. They're they're there to talk to you about their religion. Or it's two young men and nice haircuts, white shirts, black ties, elder tags, the Mormons. They're there to talk to you about your religion. Is your response to open the door, welcome them in, and just unpour your whole life, just pour everything out to them? And I'm going to guess not. Now, some of us pastor types, we, we like to engage them once in a while. They came to my church in Canada one time, and I actually they came to our daycare, and I invited them back, uh, the elders. And uh, we had a wonderful conversation, at the end of which they never showed up again. Uh, but not everyone likes to do that. And I would certainly never get deeply personal with them. And why is that? Because there's no relationship. Because there's no trust. These people have an agenda. They answer for every stop they make and every conversation and how much literature they give out. They, they have an accounting of that every, every week. And we know that. So there's nothing there. So why would you open up and trust them for anything? I've done that. Years ago, we were in a church plant in Philadelphia, and we were at a restaurant, and in the side room there, like restaurants have rooms, you can get a group in there, 15 or 20 people, and there was a bunch of lawyers. I'm assuming they were lawyers. They were businessmen. They were celebrating something. There was a lot of, it was loud and laughter and raucous, and, and we were in a church that was very bold with our evangelism. I had bright orange Bible talk cards made up, and it just an invitation. We were invited to a Bible talk and a date and a place, and... I went in, I said, excuse me, guys, excuse me. Went around the table, 15 or 20 lawyers. Just want to invite you to a Bible talk. The room just got like silent. I mean, why someone didn't get up and just hit me or tell me, you know, get out of here. They, they accepted it. They're like, oh, well, thank you very much. And very awkward silence. I left the room. They went back to their partying. And I was proud. 
I was so bold. Look at me. I went in there and invited all these guys to a Bible talk. And, and, and maybe, maybe I pricked the conscience of one of them and he decided to investigate spiritual things further. I don't know. Maybe when I get to heaven, one of them will show up and say, hey, man, thanks for being a jerk in the restaurant. That's what I was. I was a jerk for Jesus. And I was proud of it. I was rude is what I was. And my prayer is I didn't do any more damage in the name of Jesus. There was no relationship. I had no credibility to speak into their lives or to even invite them anywhere, much less a Bible study with a bunch of strangers. That, that, was, that was just dumb. Holy dumb, but dumb. Here's the thing. I speak from experience. It's easier to be bold and obnoxious than to take the time to build relationships. Let me say that again. It's easier to be bold and obnoxious than to take the time to build relationships. And believe me, building relationships takes time. Tim Harlow again. Most people come to faith because someone demonstrated Christianity before they declared it. They lived out their faith in the presence of their non-Christian friends to the point where they're like, I want what you have. And then they were willing to listen, but they didn't start with words because they had no relational foundation. And that is just so very important. I don't know anyone that ever came to Christ, and when I got them in the baptistry, they said, you know, and some, I love when I do baptisms, I love asking people, what led you to this point? And usually it's a story about a relationship they had with somebody else. Well, I was didn't know I needed God until I ran into this person and they invited me to church or they listened to me or they prayed with me. It's usually a relationship that brings someone to Christ. I've never had someone say, you know, it was, it was that bumper sticker that said, in case of rapture, you know, this car is going to be unmanned. And I thought, I don't want to get hit by an unmanned car, so I'm going, to search, I'm going to search out Jesus. People just don't come to Christ that way. Um, you know, it, no one ever says, well, it was a John 3.16 sign that I saw on TV one time. And so I went and I Googled it and I read that God so loved the world. I thought that's me. And so I just found myself a church and a Christian and here I am. That may happen, not saying it doesn't happen. It's just very rare. And my advice for a lot of people is get those stinking bumper stickers off your car, especially when you're driving the way you do. <laughs> That's a tremendous witness. No, no, they're obnoxious, but we think we're doing a fantastic witness deal with them and we're off the hook, but no, the, the real witnessing comes when relationships take place. So if our primary mission field is our relationships. Your Jerusalem is where you live, is the people you already know. I'm not saying you got to go out there and make a bunch of new relationships and add more stuff to your already stressed, busy life. But if our mission field, if your mission field is relationships, what this means is you got to be more intentional with the relationships you already have. Also means you got to, you got to get out of your comfort zone, which I love. One of my favorite memes is, is the one that is, uh, it's like, here's, here's your comfort zone over here. And then way over here, it says where the good stuff happens. <laughs> the good stuff in life. And you know this is true. This is true in, in, in every area of your life. When you get out of your comfort zone, that's where you grow. And that's, that's where your experiences expand. And especially when it comes to sharing our faith and growing the kingdom and having a kingdom impact. Comfort down here, outside the comfort zone. That's where the good stuff happens. And I just, are you willing to get out of your comfort zone for the sake of the kingdom of God? Or is it just always going to be safe and cozy and warm and snuggle wuggle? Woo! You know, like how you don't want to get out of bed in the morning. You just want to pull the blankets over. Why? Because it's comfortable. But life happens out there. And kingdom impact happens out there. What I like to call this is strategic consumerism. A couple examples. Back in Maryland... I used to eat at this restaurant called Frisco's. It was funky, it was fantastic. 
I went there several times a week. I got to know the owners. I got to know the, the workers, the salad makers, the sandwich makers. I would cut up with them. I love asking servers their stories. Like, did you know at age five that, that you wanted to be working here at age 35 or 25 or however old they are? And, and they, I, they tell me their stories. Well, no, I'm going to school or this happened or I got a divorce or uh, all sorts of things happen there. At, at Frisco's, it got to, I, I, I lost like 60 pounds on the South Beach diet and it was because they made a special salad for me. And they said, if you can come up with a San Francisco name that has Jim in it, we'll name the salad. So yeah, they came up with Sonny Jim, who was a, who was a mayor, uh, rather corrupt mayor, I believe, of San Francisco back in the early 1900s or something like that. And we had a newspaper come out and they took our picture and it's a big story. And, and that happened because of strategic consumerism. My desire there was not to just get no get to know these people but but to hopefully build a build a bridge to the Lord with them I, I do that now here in Astoria I get coffee every day you know, can I make it at home yeah would it save me a lot of money yeah two and a half bucks that's a lot of money for coffee every day but I drive through my local coffee kiosk which is what they have up here all over the place it's the Pacific Northwest it's the coffee capital of the world they see my car in line, they make it, I get to the window, it's already made, it's done. Why is that? Because I go every day and I'm trying to get to know them in the minute or so interaction that we have. I ask questions, I just try to be friendly, listen. And and one gal mentioned that she's gonna be gone for a, a while. I'm not gonna see her after next week. And I'm like, oh, I, I wanna know what's up, but you know, women have surgeries, you don't wanna ask too many questions. So finally, it's like the last day that she's working and I, I finally just said, you know, my wife wants to know, how can we pray for you? So now the ball's in her court, she can give me as little or as much information as she wants. And she says, well, just pray that it works. I'm like, well, that's really helpful. I still don't know what kind of surgery this is. And there's a line of cars behind me and I must've made an expression that kind of said, you know, I'm still a little bit confused. She goes, oh, it's shoulder surgery and she has a tear and they're gonna finally repair it. And I was like, okay, but just that, that, that question, you know, it's, it's a result of being strategic and being intentional and it's powerful. You know, we, we think if I'm gonna share my faith with someone, I gotta really dump it all out on them and I've done that with terrible results. Just try this question. This is actually your homework. If you're a follower of Jesus, try this. How can I pray for you? Odds are no one's ever asked them that. And then listen. And maybe if the time's right, you feel led, maybe offer a brief prayer right then. That is powerful. They will never forget that and they will appreciate that. And now you're developing some relational credibility that might just lead to a bridge to God. So the challenge is, who's already in your world that you can deepen a relationship with? That's a great prayer. Say, God, who you got for me today? Who's out there that maybe I can ask the prayer question? Let's call that the prayer question. How can I pray for you? That's a great challenge. As a matter of fact, these relationships need to consume our prayer times. One of the things that bothers me when we get together as a church sometimes, we take prayer requests, and I'm not a huge fan of that on Sunday mornings because you never know where it's going to go, but it's all these medical issues. They're important, I get that. But where or never do I hear, I'm, I'm praying for so-and-so to come to Christ. That's when prayer meetings get really powerful and effective and, and meaningful. That's, that's kingdom stuff, and, and we get so sidetracked and derailed with our own needs and hurts and wants. Next week, we're going to look at Acts chapter 10 and 11, a really cool story. Jesus' apostles were slow in the uptake. They didn't get this, what we're talking about now. If you're like, ah, this doesn't make sense to me. I haven't heard this before. I'm not real comfortable with this. I don't like what he's saying. You're in good company. The apostles didn't get it either. So it takes a while. I understand that. But in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, God's got to do something really dramatic to to intervene so that the apostles of Jesus open up their circle of friendships. Until then, it had just been a small, closed group. And Jesus is like, no, do you remember what I said? The, the gospel is going to be preached in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, uttermost parts of the world, but they didn't get that part. And so God, in Acts chapter 10, 11, is, is going to push the issue to get them, what? Out of their comfort zone for the sake of the kingdom. He wants them 
to realize that people all around them are desperately closer to God than they realize. We're going to see that next week, Acts 10 and 11. Go ahead and read that. Same lesson we need to learn. People all around us are much closer to God, desperately closer to God than we realize. But do we see them? Do we love them? Do we care for them? Do we engage with them? Every Christian can do this. It takes no special skills to be a friend to somebody. You know that. It takes no special Bible knowledge. A lot of people never share their faith or get into their Christianity with anybody else because they're afraid they're going to ask me a question I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to feel stupid. No, no, no. To do this requires zero Bible knowledge. It's always great to learn, but zero Bible knowledge. What it requires is just caring enough about other people to bring them to a relationship with God. It doesn't require that you got to have an extroverted personality. It doesn't require that you got to be a used car salesman type that can just, you know, buttonhole people in the street and bring them into Jesus. It just requires that you care, that you want to see the people in your world come to a relationship with Christ. It, it takes it takes just a little bit of faith. It takes just a little bit of risk. So, odds are the people in your life won't get to God until you get to them. That's why we're at the bridge to nowhere, but it's not a bridge to nowhere. In your life, it can be the bridge to God. You can be the bridge that a saving relationship with Jesus Christ walks across and changes someone's life for eternity. I came across this meme on Facebook the other day and I put it up there, you can go find it. But I, I just thought it, 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 it just expresses so well what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Here we go, high tech here. This year, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to hang out with sinners. I want to tick off religious people. I want to tell stories that make people think. I want to choose unpopular friends. I want to be kind and loving and merciful. And I want to take, I want to take naps on boats. I love that. There you go. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm Jim Dewar, preaching guy with the Astoria Christian Church here at the Bridge to Nowhere. Or is it really? In Astoria, Oregon. Thanks for joining us this morning. Have a blessed week. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say.
What you want to do 